The baby Jesus is seen as a great symbol of peace. He is humble and mild. He is sweet and innocent. He is relatable and he is precious. He is small and he is helpless. He was made like us. And there is a great beauty to all of this, of course. And this morning I want to take us in two directions. Most of, most, both of them are wonderfully true and for which we give thanks and the first aspect I want us to reflect upon is the access to peace with God that Jesus has brought. The birth of the only begotten Son of God in Bethlehem's manger brought to earth the Prince of Peace. What kind of peace, though, has he brought? Has he brought the peace that ends war? Several songs this time of year look for that kind of world peace. I looked at one that John Lennon wrote, was hoping for the end of all wars. Has he, has he brought peace between people, interpersonal peace? Well, that certainly hasn't been achieved. And we have the interesting statement of Jesus himself in Matthew 10, verses 34 to 36. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Well, so then what kind of peace does this prince bring if he says that he didn't come to bring peace on the earth between men? In fact, he says clearly that he came to be divisive. Then why are we singing Peace, peace. Why are we singing peace on earth and mercy mild? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, I want to begin in verse 11. Ephesians 2, 11, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him. Whoops, that's not Ephesians 2. I'm like, that's not what I'm speaking on today. Okay, Ephesians 2, verse 11. I had the right reference right. I looked down and caught chapter 1. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus... You who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For th through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Remember that this passage comes right after the great teaching on salvation, that we are saved by grace through faith, which is a gift from God. Paul taught about salvation that it was apart from works. It was against self-righteousness. 
but that we are saved unto good works that God has prepared for us. And following that pinnacle of doctrinal teaching, Paul continues moving forward to describe how Jesus came to be the access point of peace. That peace is brought about by destruction of the Jewish system of religion that separated the people of God from everyone else. There was enmity and there was strife between those who were circumcised and those who were uncircumcised. Salvation was only offered through, uh, uh, to the world if they would repent of their paganism and embrace the God of Israel and then submit to the laws of morality and of distinction that God had given them. Salvation came through the Jews. And Paul says in verse 12 that the Gentiles, that is non-Jews, they were excluded from the commonwealth or the citizenship of Israel. The rest of the world did not have the benefits of the protections and the blessings of God's favor upon the nation of Israel. The Gentiles were strangers to the covenants of promise, and without them, it left the rest of the world without hope. That's what Paul is saying. Paul made the understatement of the year when he described us in verse 13 as having been far off. We were worlds apart from all of the benefits and the blessings of being a part of the people of God. And it reminds us of Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? What was Paul's response? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. The Jewish people had wonderful benefits because they had been entrusted with the word of God, his promises, the description of all of his works and his laws, and the Gentiles had none of it. Therefore, the Jews had a tremendous advantage. But Christ Jesus, who has been preached now to the Gentiles, has brought the Gentiles near to God by his blood. Verse 14. He is his himself... Our peace. And what is that peace then? It is peace with God. Verse 16 confirms this. Ephesians 2, 16. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. By it having put to death the enmity. Jews and Gentiles are both able to be reconciled to God... Because Jesus provided the way of peace by putting to death the enmity with God. And enmity is a great word. Not one we, we use commonly today. What does it mean? Enmity means deep-seated and often mutual hatred. That's what enmity means. A feeling or a state of hatred or animosity. And when you put enmity to death, you bring peace. And the place where that hatred lived was between God and man. Both Jew and Gentile were at war with God by nature. We read from Genesis chapter 3, we find that the curse upon man is universal. But the Gentile was especially far off because he was not blessed with God's gracious provision of the Scripture. All the Gentile had was the knowledge of God in general revelation in the creation and in his own person. But since the great flood, men have rebelled once more against God and spread his hatred for God throughout the world. And God was not obliged to deal kindly with them outside of his covenant faithfulness to the line of Shem and on through the people of Israel. But it is Christ who brought peace to the whole world, not just to Israel. And he did it by putting to death the mutual animosity, the war of hate between man and God. 
How did he accomplish this? Go back to verse 14. He made both groups, that is Jew and Gentile, into one, and he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. What was the dividing wall? What was it that kept the Gentiles out and away from having peace with God? The middle of verse 15. It was the law of commandments contained in ordinances. It was the Jewishness of Israel that separated them from the world. If a Gentile was to be saved, they needed to turn away from their own nation. From their own idolatry and their false gods. They needed to acknowledge that Yahweh was God. And they needed to believe his word. Which meant that they needed to join the Jewish nation. The, the, the nation of Israel was to be a magnet. It was to be that which drew people to it. In order to find from, through them, through God's revelation to the Jewish people, salvation. But that's a big barrier, isn't it? He broke down the wall of division. So, if a Gentile was going to get saved prior to Christ, they needed to join the Jewish nation. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to look forward to God's remedy for sin through participating in the sacrificial system. They were expected to adopt the commandments contained in ordinances of Israel's God. And though we see a few examples of this in the Old Testament, when Gentiles converted to Judaism, it was generally rare. God had determined to not make peace with the world outside of working through his covenant people of Israel. But what did the coming of Jesus do? He broke down that wall of division, verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Christ took away the distinction of Jewish laws of sacrifice. He abolished the dietary laws of separation, and he established himself. As the central figure to which both Jew and Gentile must look. Both Jew and Gentile. One new man in Christ. It is through Christ that both the Jew and the Gentile are united. Because the source of their salvation is the one same man. Who has abolished, knocked down, torn down the dividing wall. He, fulfill, he fulfilled all that Israel failed to accomplish themselves. He fulfilled all righteousness and was the goal of all the Jewish laws of distinction that had formerly separated them from the world. But now those ordinances are no longer needed. Why? Because Jesus did what the commandments were unable to do in their weakness. The law pointed to Christ, but it was not a substitute for Christ. The keeping of the law was only valuable as a demonstration of faith in the promise of, of God's ultimate resolution. His salvation through the Messiah. And what was amazing for me to think about as I prepared this message for you this morning is that Jesus' earthly ministry was itself a great foreshadowing of what would take place after his death and resurrection. In the Gospels, we find multiple outsiders to Judaism being brought to faith through Jesus alone. Gentiles and Samaritans were saved through faith in Jesus alone and did not convert to Judaism. They simply looked to Jesus in faith and they came up and they then obtained spiritual life. And this is the reality that Jesus, excuse me, that Paul was rejoicing in. Peace with God for both Jew and Gentile came through the one person, Jesus Christ. Look at verses 17 and 18. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him 
We both have our access in one spirit to the Father. One of the lines in the Christmas carol, O Holy Night, says that his gospel is peace. The message of the good news to the world is that Christ has given access to God, uh, given access to God the Father in one spirit. Peace with God, that is the removal of enmity between you and God, is available through the one way of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul affirmed that that means by which that peace is appropriated is by God's grace. It is by God's grace being shown to individuals through the gift of faith. This gospel now goes out to the nations. It is no longer to be a, a, a Israel is no longer to be the magnet that draws everybody to itself. Rather, now the gospel has gone from Israel and is now going out to all of the nations. Both Jew and Gentile must only look to Christ now and live access to God has come through Jesus Christ no longer is access to God through Israel the nation it is now through the one man Jesus Christ that we have access to God and that leads me to my second point this morning and that is access to God does not mean that man may come to God easily Christ came as a baby in the manger in order that he might make God accessible to both Jew and Gentile. But that does not mean that coming to God through Christ is easy. And this is a major problem with too much modern evangelical religion. Jesus said in John 6, that no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. In verse 65, he said that no one can come unless it has been granted to him from the Father. Luke 9, 23 and 24. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who who will save it. You see, it was not easy for the Gentiles to come to Yahweh in salvation because they had to give up their old life of paganism. They had to give up their old country and nation. They had to give it all away in order to embrace Israel's God. Jesus didn't make it easier he simply provided the access. It is still the same as it was from the beginning. You must be brought to God by God. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross. That's an instrument of death. Be willing. Are you willing to die in order to have Jesus? That is not easy. And it is proven in the fact that few are those who find that narrow path and that small gate. If you want access to God, if you want the peace with God that Jesus brings, that you must have, it only comes if you deny yourself. Access to God only comes if you reject all of you as worthy and capable of attaining to the righteousness that God requires, which means that you must repent. It means you must see yourself as unworthy of the baby, unworthy of the cross, unworthy of life. You must turn away from all of your sin and you must come to Christ in faith by following him. It means that your life of self is over. It means that you give up on you and you die to sin. It means that you have um, all that all that you want is Jesus. He is the message of peace with God and he has granted access to the Father through faith in him. He has broken down the dividing wall. No longer must you go to Israel to be saved. 
The access is not easy. It is actually impossible apart from the Spirit of God. And where we can go wrong in the church is to make access to God easy. The access to God that Christ has made can be confused with the path to God being easy. And of course, we come to God apart from our works. But we can make that sound easy, can't we? But that has always been the case. That is not new. Never did man come to God by works. Man has never come to God through keeping the law or by doing works of righteousness. It has always been by grace, through faith. And that is in no way easy for cursed, sinful men. Therefore, we must not act like faith is easy. We must not sell peace with God by some superficial message. I shared with you a long time ago uh, the shame of the worst gospel presentation that I had ever heard. It was communicated by a graduate of the Master's Seminary. And in trying to make access to God easy, he invited the audience from Romans 10 verse 9 to simply, in the quietness of their heart, confess that Jesus was Lord and that God had raised him from the dead and that they didn't have to tell anyone. And by that simple act of private confession, only in your heart, they were to consider themselves to be saved. Never mind that he was teaching from Romans chapter 10 verse 9, which specifically calls for a confession with the mouth. That's not quiet, private in your heart. And there was no preaching of the conviction of sin, no call to be baptized, no expectation to join the church. There was no explanation of what it means to confess Jesus as Lord. No talking about a life of cross-bearing and of following Christ. Just a simple, just confess it quietly in your heart. You don't have to tell anyone. Just believe because that's all that's necessary. You don't have to do any works, of course. But it was so woefully insufficient. It was so terribly easy. So that's what he did. He gave him an easy gospel that can do nothing but provide a false assurance of peace with God. When in fact they are still in their sins and have not truly experienced peace with God. The gospel of peace with God was made easy. Confusing the access to God being made in Christ. That is just one example of making peace with God easy instead of faithfully proclaiming what it means to have access to God through Christ. Today we have the ease of online church. We have the ease of self-esteem. Listen to this quote from the false teacher Tim Keller. The God of the universe became a wiggling baby in order to get close to you. I'm debating on whether or not to say this next line. I wrote it, so I'll say it. That's diarrhea. That is an attempt to make access to God easy by appealing to your own love of self. That is not the deny yourself message. That is the message of, aren't you wonderful? Jesus just wants to be close to you. He became a wiggling baby just so he could get close to you. Just so you would understand him. The truth is that the second person of the Trinity took on human flesh with the first and foremost goal of glorifying God by accomplishing the redemption of totally unworthy, wretched sinners whom the triune God had predestined for grace and mercy before the foundation of the earth. That is not trying to get close to you. That is access to God for both Jew and Gentile, but it is not easy. And we must declare the truth of the gospel, that peace with God is accessible through repentance and faith in Christ alone. But we must not seek to make it easy beyond what the scripture has revealed. 
In fact, it was not easy at all. It required the death of God's Son. And if you think that He was just going to die on the cross, that you could superficially just nod your head or stay quiet in your heart without giving your life up to Him, you are completely deceived. It is impossible to believe and have peace with God unless God seeks peace with you. By the earlier verses of Ephesians 2, where God says that he makes a a dead sinner come to life. Because you're spiritually dead apart from him. He has to come and make you alive. And he grants faith to believe because of the love which he has showed in Christ that made the grace of God applicable by that gift of faith. The baby in the manger is not about getting a cuddle with God. He is the Lord before whom we must lowly bend and cry out to be saved from the wrath of God against me, the sinner. On this Christmas day, Let us worship God for the peace that we have with Him through the sending of His Son in the flesh. That we might have access to God. Last I checked, and I could be wrong, I don't know everybody's history. You all's Gentiles. But we have access to God. We can glorify God and give praise to Him that He has given us access to the Father. Through the peace that he purchased on the cross for us. And let us never compromise the message of the gospel by making a saving relationship with Christ easy to obtain. Let us declare the glory of Christ's incarnation so that our God gets all the glory in the salvation of sinful men. For he is worthy of it all. Our Savior gave us access. And our God accomplishes all salvation on behalf of his people. That he has purpose to show mercy to you in love that is all from him and deserved by none of us. Let's pray. Our God, we, we thank you for this wonderful truth. We thank you for keeping the promise to Abraham that through his seed all the nations all the families of the earth would be blessed that in the fullness of time you saw fit to send your son into the world that out from the people of Israel would come forth the great savior of the world that we as Gentiles would have the access to you thrown wide open. But with that access, we ask your forgiveness and we ask for your help that we may not compromise and cheapen that which you have accomplished and revealed in your word. And we pray that our message would be faithful, that we would declare the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would not seek to make superficial converts. That we would not delight in seeing the sprouting of plants along the road and on the rocky ground. That we would not delight in seeing the superficial evidence of life that isn't real. That only thorns choke out. But Father, we pray that we would be faithful to communicate the full truth of the gospel. That your spirit would take the word and bring about life that bears abundant fruit. For that is what you desire. You desire to save people unto good works that you prepared for us. And so we pray that. You would make us faithful and that you would receive all the glory for that is the purpose for which you do everything. 
And so may we be participants as your children in bringing about what you are ultimately going to accomplish. May it flow from us that glorifying of God through the works and praises and worship of your people. We pray that you would add in these days many more sons destined for glory. We pray that you would be honored and glorified today as we celebrate the birth of our Savior who gave us access to the Father. We pray this in Jesus' name.